We're counting down by the second, so we should be starting any second now. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Andre Ward. I serve as the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. I'm joined by my dear colleague and Karen uh, Du, who joins us. Karen, how are you feeling this morning? I'm great. How are you? And Karen is our colleague and works with us in our Rothenberg Center for Public Policy and serves as our intern uh, working on MSW and is instrumental in putting together this really amazing panel that we have for you as we look at reentry for women, trans women, and the LGBTQIA plus community, housing, health, and healing. And we have an amazing group of panelists, all of whom are leaders in the field. And we're really grateful that they've joined us this morning. Um, this webinar will serve as a series of webinars that the Fortune Society will be offering throughout the year, highlighting issues that are relevant to our community and looking at and focusing on advocacy and criminal legal reform efforts. Today, we're joined by, again, panelists who come from a wide range of different areas, but areas that are central to women, trans women, and the LGBTQIA community, especially as it relates to reentry, housing, health, and healing. And we thought that this webinar was really important, Karen and I, and the Fortune Society, because all too often, historically, and even today, women, trans women, and people from our LGBTQIA plus community are often not involved in the decision and discussion processes as it relates to what impacts their lives, especially as it relates to reentry, especially as it relates to housing, and especially as it relates to healing and health. But today we have committed leaders in the field who are amplifying this issue and continue to build up the ranks of women, trans women, and people from the LGBTQIA plus community to ensure that their voices are heard, that their issues are addressed, and equally as important that the conditions in which they are experiencing are changed. So we're joined today by our panelists. We have the Reverend Sharon White Harrigan is certainly no stranger to this work and is a dear colleague and sister and friend and leader in the work. And she is the executive director of the Women and Community Justice Association and has helped lead the campaign to pass the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act she is also executive director of the Beyond Rosie's campaign, which is committed to bringing the women back into the community safely. We also joined by Wendy Sawyer. She is a research director of the Prison Policy Initiative, who has written extensively about the myriad issues facing women and with criminal legal system involvement, from police encounters to incarceration and reentry. And then we have joined with us Council Member Kristen Richardson Jordan. KRJ, as we affectionately call her, out of Central Harlem, District 9, who is a leading activist, author, and member of the LGBTQIA community, and believes in serving people in all areas, including but not limited to housing, environment, health, food, education, and criminal police justice, policing justice. And then someone who else is a leader in the field is T.S. Candy. T.S. Candy is directly impacted trans woman who is an award-winning global trans activist, civil libertarian, organizer, justice leader, and founder of the nonprofit organization, Black Trans Nation. And we have Professor Angela Adalia, who is no stranger to the Fortune Society. Her relationship with our CEO, Joanne Page and Fortune dates back over two to three decades. And we're grateful to have her. And Professor Adalia is of the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University and has been an advocate for people in reentry and health concerns, and is the principal investigator for FUSE, F-U-S-E, with her work focused on the importance of housing services in the facilitation of reentry and successful community return. People, leaders, thank you so much for joining us here for this really important discussion. And Karen and I are just really excited to have you here, as well as the Fortune Society. So for the sake of time, um, in our webinar today, we'll refer to women, trans women, gender non-conforming women, and members of the LGBTQIA plus community as simply women. We hope you understand that we mean to be fully inclusive in every way throughout our discussion today. Karen? Uh, well, we won't have uh, chat activated. Thank you, Andre. Uh, but we will open up the Q&A and uh, you can click that on the bottom of your screen uh, in most, uh, on most screens. 
and uh, our team will review uh, the questions and we'll try to uh, answer at least the ones that are uh, you know, most appearing as best we can uh, within the time that we have here. So you can post your questions there and our team will look at them. And at the end, end we'll try to answer as many as possible. Absolutely. So we'll jump right into it, starting with KRJ, as we affectionately call Council Member Jordan, who represents District 9. And, you know, we'll start with you. You know, as I know, like, you've, you have a tight schedule this morning, so we want to really get right into some, some thoughts and reflections that you have relative to this really important discussion. Um, we thank you for all the amazing work you're doing in Central Harlem and District 9. But what are some of the policy proposals you are advocating for that affect women? in our inclusive definition for it today regarding housing, health, and reentry. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me on the panel. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I, will, I will start by saying that um, I really believe in housing as a human right and housing for all. I also believe um, in, in jobs for all. And I know that those are radical concepts for people, um, particularly when we then start talking about the space of re-entry where we have those who have been uh, criminalized and in a lot of cases vilified as well. So um, the, the, the very idea, the very notion that, hey, these are humans and as human beings, uh, folks deserve a home and folks deserve a job um, and folks deserve basic health services. Um, is, is itself seen as revolutionary, or, although I still can't quite figure out why. Um, uh, but in terms of specific policies, I'm really hoping that in the city council, we could see um, the, the Fair Chance Act come back um, as a chance to stop employer um, employment discrimination. Um, that is, um, you know, banning uh, this idea of banning the box so that um, employers are not uh, asking people about their previous uh, criminal history. Um, I also think that with housing, uh, we need to make a, a strong effort generally to look at housing as a, as a human right, um, but also to stop the housing discrimination um, for those who are, are returning um, from incarceration. So I'm hoping, oh, and um, last, but definitely certainly not least, um, our budget. Um, I'm hoping to see some uh, changes in the budget that actually reflect the fact that we have the most diverse uh, city council in history um, in New York City. And, um, and I hope that we can get it to, to be more than symbolism, um, but in fact, uh, show in concrete and substantive ways how we're going to fund um, uh, programs and services for those who are returning home. Um, and that's all inclusive services for those returning home um, and paying attention to re-entry um, as an issue. So city council budgeting, right? In terms of funding to ensure that resources in the way of funding is allocated to support re-entry services. As you mentioned, Councilman Rejoining, the other piece you mentioned around the importance of housing. We know that the Fair Chance for Housing Act did not pass in 2021, but in 2022, obviously it's being reintroduced and certainly something that we know that you and other council members support. So we'll be looking for a fair chance for housing act to be passed in this year. Um, we have a whole new city council, as you said, and then you mentioned about the whole notion of fair chance act, generally speaking, as it relates to employment. Three critical, important ideas that you've shared um, that's relative to this conversation. And so now I want to transition to our dear colleague, Sharon White Harrigan, uh, or Reverend Sharon White Harrigan, uh, what systems should be in place to ensure people who are formerly incarcerated have their voices heard? Like you've been doing this work for many, many years. You work with women who have been in housing. You've led those efforts, right? You ran housing, uh, uh, supportive housing for women. Talk to us about um, what systems should be in place to ensure people who are formerly incarcerated have their voices heard. Thank you so kindly, brother. And I just want to say thank you so much for having me and hello to all of the uh, brilliance that is around me right now on this panel. It is an honor and a privilege. All systems, I'm going to say, you know, um, need to be in place. Understanding that for so long, right, women have been underrepresented, have been, you know, 
under-acknowledged, has, you know, been disrespected, disregarded, you name it, you know, and that is us, right? And so at every point, every corner at every point in every policy and every system right we should be at the table right we should be involved in our right in our plan in anything that involves us you know and in the words of of my dear dear friend Ruth McDaniels if you're not at the table you're on the menu We're tired of being on the menu, right? And so we need to be involved in, you know, every system from the welfare system, right? To even the jail system, the prison system, right? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we be at the table? People have this way of, you know, collecting information, collecting narratives from people and then call themselves the experts. That's not how it works, right? That's just not how it works. Not only are people experts in their experience, but they're experts in 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 what is going on in their community. And I'm sorry, you know, I don't want to bring, you know, that that binary, but understand that a white community cannot tell a black community what their needs are. That's just not acceptable. It's not, not anymore, you know? And so we need to be involved in every aspect of us, anything pertaining to us, anything that reflects or involves the black community, the brown community, the trans community, every community we should be involved in. Thank you for that too. Karen? Thank you, Sharon. That was really important and powerful. I know you uh, uh, have dealt a lot with or women who have been uh, traumatized in their childhood and uh, in their young lives, and then they're re-traumatized by uh, by being in prison, and then so upon re-entry, they have all of that um, held within them uh, to deal with as they're trying to find housing and, and and you know rebuild their lives too. Do you want to weigh in on that? Absolutely. I think what people fail to, it's not even just trauma, it's tragedy, right? So we have trauma and tragedy hand in hand, you know, and it's, we cannot forget about, we can't get past, we can't, you know, it's hard to reconcile with things that still exist for us, right? So we just don't have childhood trauma everybody doesn't have childhood trauma but we have these traumas that are that is in our timeline of life right and for the black community for the brown community we you know we're also talking about racial trauma we're talking about historical trauma we talk about generational trauma and although directly i'm i'm not affected in a way to where i wasn't there in slavery but to understand to you know carrying that information holding what has happened to our ancestors to our family members is a burden in itself coupled with what goes on in our daily life and in the world around us, right? And that then includes the injustices, how our communities are marginalized, how they are targeted, how they disenfranchise. I'm targeted is what I wanted to say. And so unfortunately, we come to the table already with this compounded trauma, right? This package trauma. And it's hard to move past these layers. Why? Because certain things still exist. The systems work, but they don't work for us, 
right? They work for the ones who built them because they were never intended for us. So when we when we have these not even so much needs, when we when we need resources, when we need support, they are designed by people who can't possibly understand what it is that we go through. Yeah. especially when their ancestors are responsible for some of the trauma that we are enduring. So it's, it's just understanding, right, how we as women, and, and, and here's this community, what we need to understand. In every aspect of life, women are at the core, right? We are the heart, the pulse, of the community, right? We take care of the children, the household. You go to a man's prison, it's women or those who identify as women sitting in that visiting room. You go to a woman or a non-gender uh, non conforming prison, you see women and those who are identifying with, as women sitting in the visiting room. You go into the churches, it's the women or those who identify as women. You go into a, a, a classroom, you see the same. You go anywhere, you see it. You go into a household, it's the women that is cleaning the house, fixing all of the repairs, you know, making food for the children, helping them with their homework, and yet trying to keep themselves together and prepare themselves for work and all of that stuff for the next day. But yet we are the least thought about. Yet we are the ones who are the most disregarded in this. And what people don't understand is that when you do invest, in the women, you are investing in the family, you are investing in the men. And I don't want to diminish the roles of men, but I, I'm sorry, right? For so very long, it's been about the men. So it's not about them right now, right? Yes. We need to bring the women, gender non-conforming, gender expansive, trans women. We need to come to the forefront, not just have these conversations periodically, but every day, all day, we should be talking about women because we are the ones who fuel the community. I'm off my soapbox Thank now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. That was amazing. So um, I'm going to turn this really, that was powerful. Great. I'm so glad we're doing this today. Uh, so I'm going to turn, turn the conversation to uh, Professor Angela Edala and Angela, I could call you Angela. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Excellent. You and Wendy Sawyer here are deeply engaged in the research on the topics of women in, in reentry and the challenges regarding housing and health. So it's wonderful to have you both here. You know, data is important for all of us. We need to look at that data. It's hard to prove things are happening without, you know, all the research that you that you do so diligently and uh, you know wonderfully. So Wendy's research is on a national scale. And uh, Angela, you talk specifically about women's reentries from local jails in New York City, yeah. including women uh, with multiple incarceration experiences. So first, we wanna ask you about the highly e effective and successful program called FUSE. Can you tell us about that, how it succeeded? Sure, sure. First, first, I wanna say thank you so much also for inviting me. And um, I wanna say amen to uh, Reverend <laughs> what Harrington, because I totally, I could not agree more. And let me say, as an academic fighting for my staff are all community folks with lived experience. I, I cannot, I don't, I mean, you know, I'm the facilitator, right? Not, not the one that's doing the work um, with persons living with HIV who are homeless, unstably housed, and persons returning from jail and prison, and, you know, persons in, 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 in neighborhoods of, of threat, uh, violence, and challenge. And so, I, um, I, uh, I appreciate it and I want to say that finally, 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 I think there's some openness to including that. Uh, when we're how can we talk about social determinants of health if the, if the, if the researchers in, in academia or the clinic do not have any understanding or experience with that? Anyway, so I, I don't have, I have a separate and a modest soapbox in the academic and research community, but uh, but, but I'm with you in terms of talking about, let me talk just a little bit um, about FUSE. FUSE stands for Frequent Users Services Engagement. And it's, um, 
it's, it's an initiative that came about because providers and community members and, and individuals themselves with um, incarceration experience, you know, kind of noticed this, this, or it's come to the attention that, you know, jails, especially uh, multiple, um, or as often as not, people have multiple episodes of jail. They're routinely incarcerated and reincarcerated. And by the way, this is more often for women who will end up having, this is a slide that, that's from actually Wendy's work on the national level that, you know, at least 1.4 million women are jailed each year and more than one in five are jailed multiple times, three or more arrests that is in one year, right? Um, and so um, I don't wanna take lots and lots of time, but I do wanna talk about, and I wanna nod that, you know, the, the, the uh, Fortune Society was really part of um, a, a leadership in terms of an advocacy group. And I think that, again, back to your point, Karen, about research. Research without advocacy is dusty books on a shelf and an advocacy without research is a temper tantrum. That's a quotation from, from, from a community member um, that, I've, that I've worked with over the years. Um, and so, so the um, effort was to kind of institute an initiative um, that addressed this issue particularly. Uh, Vera did some institute, did some study finding that, you know, um, 500 persons that they looked at had a total that were the ones that had at least 18 jail admissions in, in the past five years. The, the average was something like over, over 300, uh, uh, 300 days, um, you know, 10,000 10, days, 300 admissions among this group of individuals. I mean, it really led to the, the FUSE initiative, which was housing-based. Um, because the, the looking at administrative data matches, and this was a time also, again, thanks to advocacy, I think, in terms of getting the attention of, um, and this is for, this is for, um, uh, this is for the uh, uh, KAR also, if I can tell you that, uh, Commissioner, because it was a time when there was a political um, kind of uh, openness to kind of thinking about easing some restrictions to providing housing assistance for personal with criminal justice history, brought together corrections, brought together housing, homeless, um, you know, Department of Health to kind of do a big data match to identify, okay, how many? Well, there are over a thousand every month that have had five admissions into jail and shelter, right? In a limited period of time. Um, and so this became seen as the eligibility for the few, some resources were put behind it. It's housing-based, it's housing-based reiteration. It's permanent housing, permanent supportive housing for persons with multiple episodes of jail and shelter experience. It didn't have a criteria, it didn't have a criteria that persons had to have mental illness or substance issues or physical health problems, but but those kinds of issues were were highly prevalent among this uh, particular population. Um, uh, multiple, multiple health, uh, behavioral health and social needs. Um, so the the um, Again, in the um, uh, next slide, please. What I want wanted to say is, once we enrolled, Bush, uh, uh, we at Columbia, in collaboration with Corporation for Supportive Housing, did, did some, some research on this. And by the way, did the data match, administrative data match, all that highly statistical stuff. But we also did in-person interviews because the question, question again is understanding not just do they have an admission to these institutions, but what is what's the situation of their lives and how the context changing the context of their life by providing housing, safe, secure housing in a positive environment, you know, make a difference in their lives and their life trajectories. And so um, I want to show this because again, I'm not, I'm not the first to notice that, you know, incarceration increases risk for homelessness, homelessness increases risk for incarceration. Um, there are a variety of uh, a dynamic for that. And for women, especially, it starts early, it starts earlier. Some of the folks in our study uh, population were like, the first incarceration, by the way, more often, incarceration became prior to the first experience of homelessness, right? And incarceration began at eight, nine, 10 years old. Status offenses running away. Why were, why, were, why were young women and girls running away in many instances from a home situation that was threatening or violent, abusive, um, um, or just, uh, again, through uh, various kinds of, um, um, loss, also parents themselves incarcerated, incarcer incarcerated or, or, or lost, um, um, uh, or early death or, or other kinds of um, concern and, 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 and running away from, uh, running away from um, 
from Foster or whatever. Um, but my point is that this shows, I think, that early on, this is the, the, the um, 36 months or three years prior to the beginning of the initiative, and that you see that there's quite a variation in terms of experience of being in jail or shelter. And over time, though, everybody, everybody for all days of the month are in jail and shelter, one or the other, right? Um, um, Absolutely. And we appreciate that too, Professor Adalia. We're going to transition now to um, T.S. Candy. I know Karen had some questions for T.S. And then we're going to circle back to you, uh, Professor Adalia, and also Wendy. Karen? Yes. Uh Greetings, T.S. Candy. Uh, from your perspective and your expertise, what is the experience of trans women, specifically black and brown trans women, right? A great majority uh, in the efforts to find suitable housing and how does that affect their mental, emotional and physical health? And you could bring in you know, the homelessness element in here as well, since we were just talking about that. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, um, and thank you so much to, um, to the Fortune um, Society for um, having me here. Um, I really appreciate you, um, and thank you for um, thinking of me. Um, to answer your question, um, when it comes to um, self-care, um, I can speak of speaking I, and I can also speak for um, 195 members that we have from um, the surveys that we have received. Um, and, and healthcare practices, um, well, we're a global organization where we have um, housing in um, Kenya, as well as um, Tennessee, Atlanta, um, um, California, and um, here in New York. Um, we see um, difference when you go into the red states and when you're in the blue states. Mm. Uh, we have um, so many members that, that speak about how they stayed overnight in the emergency room and have not been seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that goes to show the neglect, mm. you know, from self-care that we're trying to do how they automatically erase it because of our identity is seen as non-existence. Yeah. Here in New York, um, due to New York being a more liberal state, um, we do see, you know, um, a lot of, you know, Medicare and Medicaid that is given to, um, you know, th those that are homeless and that identify. Um, we have seen an improvement with the way that they treat, you know, the trans population here. Um, that's, a, that's a lot of, I mean, that's one of the main reasons why um, a lot of us migrate from the South to the North mm -hmm. because of the neglect and abuse and the trauma that we get down there just trying to live to be us. Yeah, um, but could you speak to uh, the anti-loitering bill or walking while trans bill as it was commonly referred to uh, that was finally uh, eradicated last year, I think February, 2021? Yes, so um, thank you so much. Um, the walking while trans ban, that particular ban was a stop and frisk. That was a ban that we saw here in the um, state of New York. Um, I was actually one of the individuals who spearheaded that law being repealed here in the state. Um, I experienced um, state sanctioned, um, a sexual state sanctioned violence from an officer who, you know, I had to give oral sex to, you know, to not go to jail. Yeah. Um, that's what we see a lot here. It's more a sexual abuse and, you know, it's more of a sexual thing here in the state of New York, um, as well as all over. Um, that particular band, you know, we fought, you know, nail and hammer and, you know, did whatever we needed to do to organize community to, you know, teach them what is lobbying, what is the state capital, what is, you know, who is the speaker? Where do we where do we start? You know, who is our city council? You know, what is our city council? What is that? So, you know, educating them on that particular, you know, level and 
filling up, you know, 52 passenger, 55 buses, you know, up to um, Albany to us uh, to share their story, their experience of just existing in public space just by wearing the clothes that they wear or just by simply walking down the street. Right, right. At every turn. That's so empowering, though. Thank you so much, T.S. Candy. Um, Andre, I'll turn it back over to you. You're, uh, uh, you're muted. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm listening, and just <laughs> listening intently. And so, you know, turning our attention now to some of the work that Wendy Sawyer does, you know, Wendy obviously as a director of, of, of research at the Prison Policy Initiative, you know, your focus has been on women, been on reentry, et cetera. Just kind of want to hear your thoughts on um, any nationally successful models for reentry programs that are serving women specifically within the context as we define women today? Yeah, um, like everyone else, I just wanna say thanks first for having me here. Um, and I do wanna say that like the FUSE model that, that Angela was talking about is really remarkable. I know it's not women specific necessarily, but it is exciting because it's um, housing based and has the research to back it up as it scales. I know that that's been, um, it's, it's now been extended into other jurisdictions and things like that. So that's clearly a, a good model. Um, and yes, thanks for showing this, this map here. This is from a piece I did a while back when I was looking at sort of how, you know, what's the, the mismatch between, you know, how many women are actually being released or going through reentry in a given year um, versus what's available to them. Um, and actually this project was inspired by another uh, example program or model program, I guess, which is the, um, it's called a new way of life reentry project that's uh, spearheaded by Susan Burton, who is also a formerly incarcerated woman. Um, so that program is based in Los Angeles, but it's expanding its model nationally through what they call the safe housing network. Um, they offer women transitional housing for as long as they need, case management, legal services, support for everything from getting an ID, uh, and social security card to getting, you know, helping regain custody of children and finding permanent housing. Um, so through the safe housing network, that model from Los Angeles is now being replicated. And I think it's something like 11 states now and it's serving women, trans and non-binary people. Um, so I think where there's not an opportunity to do something as sort of big and coordinated, like a, an effort like uh, the FUSE program, I think this is something that, um, that folks can look to as sort of a, you know, th this one woman made this happen. And, and that's how we see a lot of these programs sort of bubble up is that women, especially directly impacted women often start programs like this themselves, knowing what is missing in the reentry space and, um, and creating programs that they know will better meet women's needs. Um, I think in New York, there's, uh, there's also the Hope House, which is um, coordinated by the Ladies of Hope Ministry, Topeka Sam and I forget who her colleagues are. Um, so I know that they also have a transitional housing program in New York. Um, and I know that they, it's not up and running, but I think they have a big plan for essentially a, a service hub that would connect women who are going through reentry to the needed services and supports. Um, and just even things like developing leadership skills and entrepreneurship skills and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's like a very ambitious idea, but I think it's one that if and when it happens could be a really interesting model as well. Um, so those are a few sort of non-FUSE examples, but I do think that the FUSE uh, program is really inspiring. Absolutely. And thank you for that, Wendy, too. We're gonna transition to um, back to council member Jordan, obviously, and followed by that by Reverend Sharon White Harrigan and then to the rest of our panelists. The council member, I know that when folk were talking a little earlier, Right, you were itching, like, I want to respond to that, right, in terms of the political implications, right, because that centers, like, your work. And, and just thinking about that, um, for women who are currently facing or already engaging in reentry in your experience in District 9 or elsewhere, like, what are your thoughts on how we can support these women regarding housing and their mental, emotional, and physical health needs, right, coupled with your response, obviously, to some of what T.S. Candy had spoken about? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Andre. I, I, I did want the chance to respond because so much of, of what everyone has shared was resonating with things that are going on in our district, um, but particularly um, T.S. Candy. 
uh, when you were talking about your advocacy and, and with Walking Wild Trans. Um, one of the things that, that has come up recently is just days ago, uh, we had a police involved shooting in District 9 and it was actually doors from my new city council office. Um, and um, the lot, there was a loss of life for one of the officers, um, Officer Rivera, um, which we've heard a lot about in media. Um, there was also a loss of life for one of the tenants, uh, um, LaShawn McNeil, who we have heard very little, if anything, about. Um, and um, and and I I I give full sympathy to the families on on all those sides because we have both mothers who lost a son, and for those of us who who advocate in this space, uh, I I personally see myself as an abolitionist. I'm very open about that. Um, but even those who aren't full on abolition, if you're fighting for uh, police reform and you're fighting against brutality, uh, often we, we, we find ourselves in a space of compassion uh, and it is, is great and deep compassion uh, for humanity writ large. And it's also an emphasis on preventing things uh, before they occur, uh, funding for the root causes. And, um, and, and so I wanna say that there are women uh, in, in my community right now who are really deeply hurting um, around this question of reentry uh, because um, there is heightened alert. And history has shown us that uh, when there is heightened alert, um, when there is, is a, a push for law and order, which is, is some of what we're starting to see and some of what we're starting to feel, um, there's a very legitimate fear on the part of those who are impacted um, for there to be more criminalization, for there to be a vilification, for there to uh, be a, a feeling of not being able to walk safely down the street um, and, and just be themselves. And, um, and so I think the things we're talking about uh, from a place of compassion and care for those who are experiencing re-entry uh, is 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 even that much more important uh, the advocacy and and what we're talking about for women and centering women um, and their lives is even that much more important uh, the case that I'm referring to was a domestic violence uh, call um, and so that brings us squarely into the lives of women and um, we don't hear much from her um, but um, the mother of LaShawn McNeil uh, did speak about deeply regretting uh, calling the police. And she called because she was scared and she called because um, she wanted help for her son, um, but did not want to see uh, what happened happen. Um, and um, I don't know, I, I guess that's, that's a little off topic, but not really, because of what I, what I wanna speak to is, is our political climate and being able to continue to push for and advocate for um, these issues uh, and how to do that um, as, as I feel what, I, I feel and fear uh, what is a shift um, that, 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 that seems to be a shift that is very much uh, to, towards law and order um, in what can be an extremely destructive way. And thank you for that council member. And shifting to you, um, Reverend, Reverend Harrigan, the idea of, of the impact of these, this kind of legislation, right? New laws kind of being put in place or new practices, right? That's reintroduced, right? To the community. In terms of women themselves, talk a little about the healing aspect of the work, right? Because we talk about the trauma, we talk about the historical abuse women have experienced. Talk about like processes around healing, like what does that look like in your experience and how important that is? And then we'll circle later on to talk a little about the work you're doing with Beyond Roses. Absolutely. I, I think healing looks like reparation, folks. <laughs> you know, that's what it that's what it really, that's what it really looks like. And and just, you know. What is it? What is going on right now? I mean, if we keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to get the same results. You're not going to get different results. That's the definition of insanity. And so I, right now, 
right? We are in this, this climate, right, where things, it seems as if everything is going wrong and, and things are just starting to get punitive again. But there is this part where we are tired, sick and tired of being tired, right? And we need to enforce and, and, and just really reintroduce the word healing, right? And so, it, it, you know, they say hurt people, hurt people, but heal people, heal people. And this is what, you know, WCJA, we we try to put into all in our work, you know, whether it's staff amongst ourselves or to the community that we serve, that understanding that we all have room inside of us to heal because we're tired, right? We're tired of going through the same thing over and over again we're tired of the 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 lack of 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 dignity and 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 humanity right and integrity um when dealing with us as a community as women and so at the end of the day each one reaches one right each one teaches one and we really just need to start exercising what does healing look like for our community it starts with us right it starts with planting that seed when we understand there are just some things that we can't control in the faith community there's the song that says if you're going to pray, you shouldn't worry. And if you're going to worry, you shouldn't pray, right? And so just understanding that there are things that is beyond our control, but what we can control is us and those around us and who we serve and who we are here to support and be a resource too. And so we just really need to stop really focusing on all of the things that are going wrong and and focus on what can get right, right? What can we do to start bringing people, it's not locking people up, it's not all of those things, but what it is is people have these exhibit, these maladaptive behaviors, things manifest into the negative because their traumas have not been reconciled. People, we will never get over trauma. Certain traumas you will never get over, but you can reconcile with it. And that's where the healing begins. And I just think that we need to stop focusing on all of the negative um, maladaptive things and just really start putting into practice healing. It starts with language. Folks, we don't need case managers, right? Case managers are people who manage cases. We need people, right? to be served. So we need life coaches, we need mentors. So we need to start there, right? Just even in the words and and the things that we say, just really, we need to look at it, right? And start operating from a place and a space of healing and not just, oh, you know, we're traumatized all day long. That's, That's temporary right? Because we all can be on the road to healing if we just receive it and embrace it and then practice it. We talk about trauma-informed. We need to be trauma-responsive. That's the thing. You could know about trauma all day long. What are you doing with it? Well, the soapbox, I think, is certainly the place to be. And obviously, you're not just on the soapbox. Box, uh, Reverend Harrigan, you also are in action, jumping off the soapbox and running right into the spaces where your voice needs to be heard and action needs to be taken to affect meaningful change. So I think it's all relevant. And just turning now to to Wendy a little bit, right, and then we'll turn it back over to Karen to the rest of the panelists. Um, you know, in your research, like, what do you know about the gaps between women returning home, um, and what's available to them in terms of reentry support? I know you mentioned some of the housing efforts. Uh, that Hope House and others are involved in. So you could, you can speak a little bit more about that, Wendy. And then what can you tell us about how the current systems affect women who are primary caretakers to children and families and what can be done to improve the situation for those families? Wendy? Sure, that's, that's two big questions. Um, <laughs> but yeah, 
I mean, I can speak a little bit to sort of the gap between needs and what's available in terms of reentry support. Um, it's really hard to follow, Sharon. Um, <laughs> but uh, I can say that we know that incarcerated and formerly incarcerated uh, people who identify as women are different from men. Um, they have distinct needs, both while they're incarcerated and after being released. Um, they're the same people after release. Um, but there are just like not enough programs to meet the need and not enough spaces in those programs. Um, I mentioned already, like a lot of those programs are run by formerly incarcerated women um, because they learned firsthand how little was available um, and how sort of inadequate the things that were available were. Um, and I've heard programs that get something like 300 applications a year for something like 12 or 15 spaces. So it's just like an enormous amount of need and demand and not a lot of supply. Um, in terms of what those specific needs look like, um, Sharon has spoken really powerfully about trauma and the, and the history of, of abuse or, um, you know, all kinds of trauma, right? Generational trauma, all of those things. Um, and incarceration, incarceration itself is also a traumatizing experience. Um, you know, there's, there's even a disorder known as post-incarceration syndrome that is basically, it's like PTSD with some additional sort of social and cognitive dimensions. So people are coming out generally worse than they went in, uh, in terms of like their, their mental health, their emotional health, um, and sort of without dealing with that appropriately um, through sort of the kinds of healing that Sharon's talking about, um, a lot of people instead uh, develop substance use disorders as a way of coping or suffer from, or they just suffer from really serious psychological distress. And the numbers back that up. We do see higher rates of both substance use disorder and mental health problems among incarcerated women compared to men. We also see higher rates of um, chronic disease, infectious disease, various disabilities. Basically, women who are leaving prison and jail are really likely to be bringing with them like a whole constellation of mental and physical health problems um, that aren't generally the primary focus of reentry programs, right? Maybe drug treatment might be, but um, but in terms of dealing with the whole person and all of their issues, that's that's not typically the way that um, a standard reentry program sort of approaches things. Um, women who go to prison are also a lot poorer than their male counterparts. Um, and to add insult to injury, their likelihood of employment after release suffers more than men's does. So that's something we've called the prison penalty. I think I have a slide on that, Sarah, if you can share that. It's the um, unemployment one. Yeah, there it is, thank you. So you can see on here, uh, the unemployment rate of black women in particular goes from about 6% in the general population. Um, this is sort of working age folks, ages 35 to 44, um, goes from 6% to almost 44% among formerly incarcerated women. Um, and among white women too, you see that, that you know, it, it, they're penalized more harshly than their male counterparts going from about 4% to 23% unemployment, um, those are really astronomical unemployment rates. Um, so, so that's a real need that clearly has not been addressed well that we're seeing these, these kinds of numbers um, among formerly incarcerated people. Um, and then sort of given all of that, the poverty and the health issues, the unemployment, uh, as we know, and it's probably unsurprising that, that women leaving prison are also more likely to become homeless um, with a homelessness rate about 35% higher than men's. Um, stable housing is the number one re-entry need for women. Um, many of them don't have, you know, family, you know, a mom or grandma or partner at home to go home to. Uh, they may be trying to avoid returning to an abusive partner or something like that. Um, so they really may not have the support network to get them back on their feet the way that a lot of men do. If you look at this chart, um, I just want to highlight a couple of things here. You can see the rates of women are higher than men in the, that yellow column there. You can also see they're higher among black people and among especially people who have been incarcerated more than once. So that speaks to that cycling that Angela is talking about and that her program is focusing on. Um, and also you'll see in that last um, group of columns that basically the, the closer you are to your release date, so if you've been out a shorter period of time, you're more likely to be homeless. So this, this really gets to that re-entry period, right? That um, when people come out, they need to be immediately connected with, with housing um, because otherwise you're gonna see really high rates of homelessness. Um, 
The other thing I wanted to talk about is family reunification. This kind of gets to, or starts to get to your second question, Andre, which is, um, you know, how are, how are women um, different from men in terms of reentry needs, um, especially given their status as caretakers of children or other family members? Um, I think family reunification is a really central goal of reentry for a lot of women. Um, and that can be a strong motivator for, for women to succeed. It can also uh, really compound their stress. So, uh, so programs that can help women to, um, you know, reestablish or repair relationships with children and other family members can be really helpful. Um, and, and I know that that's something that a new way of life ranchy program does. Um, I, I don't know about others, but I know that they focus a lot on that. Um, most women who go to prison or jail are mothers and they're more likely to be primary caretakers. Um, and that basically it means that when you go to prison or jail, like you, your, your parental status is at risk. Um, there's a law that uh, generally, if a child has been in foster care for 15 out of the last 22 months, um, the welfare agency, the child welfare agency is required to initiate termination of parental rights. Um, so if your sentence is longer than 15 months, your parental rights are, are automatically at risk. Um, and I think that to deal with that, uh, the first thing that needs to be done is sort of on the front end, so not at the reentry phase, but at the decision points about whether or not to lock somebody up. Um, there are states that have enacted primary caretaker bills, which are essentially diversion efforts that expand the use of alternatives to incarceration um, for parents who have dependent children. Um, that's There's models of that in various states, and I know that there's some federal legislation uh, called the Families Act that's been proposed. Um, my main critique of those though is that they tend to exclude large numbers of people, especially those with violent felony convictions. So the impact of those bills is diminished by those kinds of carve outs. Um, they really need to make that available to, to everyone. Um, the other thing I think that needs to be done to like help those families who are separated by incarceration is to really um, make family contact as, as available as possible. So to enable visits and regular contact, um, if possible, to like house folks closer to their families, which is really hard for women because typically states have one or two women's prisons hundreds of miles from home. And it's really hard to get out there, you know, bring the kids, like arrange a whole trip out to go visit. And so that's, so family contact tends to drop off for women. And um, that's, uh, that's something that, I think some, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to advocate for like making the prison experience better, but it's really terrible in its current status. So I think we need to be protecting in-person visits, contact visits, um, sort of family friendly visitation, which they, there have been some programs that have sort of experimented with that. Um, and also just like practically speaking, lifting restrictions on things like public housing, food stamps, cash assistance, those kinds of things that families just need, those basic needs, um, those those kinds of restrictions should be lifted too. Um, right. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's great, great. That's really rich with information and, and that's a great segue to uh, T.S. Kenny in terms of uh, programs available, visitation, treatment within the prison that leads to jails or prisons, which can lead to uh, the after effects healing issues that Sharon talks about um, when trying to re-enter uh, or find housing. Do you want to weigh in on that, T.S. Candy? Um, yes, um, I will say that, you know, even within the, the jails and prisons, you know, we are erased, you know, our data is mixed in with women or men, or is just not even included. So, you know, that's the first erasure that we even go through is not even being not even correct data, you know, not even really correct, really, you know, statistics. Um, so, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so when it come down to housing, you know, we could be, um, this go back, to, this go back to, you know, the walking our trans ban, you know, we actually was able to get 10,000 cases dismissed and over 809 unlicensed massage policy cases dismissed. So, you know, when it comes down to having laws in place that um, 
you know, when you go to housing or apply for any type of housing, they're going to do a background check yeah, or whatever. So, you know, there's things that, you know, was put on our um on, on our background check that, you know, whatever we went to jail for, which can be a conflict of interest for housing. Um, so, which goes back to the operation of homelessness, you know, and, you know, going back into the shelter system or, you know, even just tired of constantly paying for application fees when you're getting denied. So it's like, you don't even have the funds to do. And when you finally get the funds to do, you're denied housing. So, or just because of the color of your skin, just because they were like, oh no, you identify or being profiled, you know? So they don't want that in their particular area or don't want to give housing. So there are so many different strands that we go through with just even trying to even blink at housing. I went through 13 shelters before I was able to get my first apartment, you know? And that was so much abuse, theft, trauma put outs and after 5 p.m. when you have to stay out now all you know overnight until you know human resources uh, come, come available at 8 a.m. the next morning you know so it's um it is it, the system is just not written to uh, the system is working fine it's working the way that it's that, that it's set up to work but it's just not working to protect us uh, those that are those that the system is written to not protect. So um, yes, I get back. And I would I would say thank you, yes, Candy. And I would say that you know being in those shelters and dealing with that night after night is going to add to the trauma uh, that we've been talking about uh, that Sharon spoke so you know wonderfully to. Um, and Angela, uh, homelessness obviously is a huge top topic which permeates all of what we're discussing here. Could you speak to the conditions and effects of homeless shelters for women like uh, T.S. Candy was just talking about or other uh, crisis care institutions for women? Well, uh, sure. And uh, particularly in terms of jail. I mean, the jail is in and out. Remember we're talking about women have higher needs in a, in a variety of ways. And you know, I, I really think the, the comment on it's not just trauma, but it's tragedy. I was just looking a quarter of the women in the FUSE project have lost a child to death. Um, sometimes that's young, sometimes that's violence, right? So um, just kind of putting that in there and then as well as the over a third that have had experience of uh, physical assault, sexual assault, um, um, you know, as child or, or a young adolescent. Anyway, in terms of, it, well, just thinking about all we're talking about and, and the health things too. Un, we saw untreated serious seizure disorder, epilepsy, right? Um, uh, type one diabetes, uh, 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 birth defect, um, uh, congenital heart defect, not treated if people are in and out of jail and in and out of shelters, right? There isn't a structure of services there. I also want to speak or connect what, what Reverend Heron said about case managers, because again, doing interviews with folks and talking to them our interviews can, they're meant to do 90 hours or they're over two hours, because if you really sit down and want to hear people's stories and want to understand, you know, say capture their voices, people have a lot to say and to share. But one of the things they talk about in terms of case managers is exactly that. The experience is somebody asking you these personal questions to deny you something, to make, you know, the, the mental health is just to see if you meet some criteria, right? You be, you, you know, are you have the right kind of disorder or this or that? And, you know, the, the, the treatment that exists because there are more men than women and I'm with you, we are not counted often. And so the, and again, I won't go into the details in terms of the medical medical field and clinical trials and the rest, we are not included. Um, so, um, but um, particularly older women, now that I'm a, a gray beard, I can relate to this a little more too, but, um, but you know the point that drug treatment doesn't doesn't acknowledge you know you, you sometimes you're not eligible if you have kids and you have what do you, what do you do with the kids that you have responsibility for um, job job programs or construction long distance truck driving a lot of these other uh, other skills um, that are necessarily not necessarily appropriate for women um, or do they have the time to kind of pursue some of these some of these options drug treatment as well too. Often again, um, uh, mental health services often for women focus on depression and don't address um, anxiety disorder 
uh, uh, trauma, et cetera, because it, the presumption is that women are, we're more weepy and, you know, sad and, you know, the, which is not always the kind, <laughs> excuse me, the only emotional and, and, and psychological needs that people might have. So, um, That's great. so the, the institutional thing is the limited services that are there, the short time to really, even if you had a wonderful person and skilled staff that people are cycling in and out because these kinds of issues are not resolved in a, a 90 day or, or six month kind of period. Um, I'm not saying that people can't really, really shift and change, but a place to live is a place to begin. I also want to speak to the fact that the fuse is not women centered, but it's person centered. And so if it's person centered, the, the housing providers try to try to staff in a way using peers also that are, are appropriate for women or persons of trans or gender, you know, uh, diversity experiences. And, you know, that I think that makes a big difference as well. That's great. We'll send it to Andre. Yes, and we'll turn this over to uh, Councilmember Jordan. Just like your thinking, Councilmember, I mean, you've heard some of the thoughts from our panel, steam panelists here today. You know, you've obviously embodied a commitment to your community and certainly to women and members of the LGBTQIA community. So just some overall thoughts, closing thoughts, council member relative to what you've heard today, the notion of housing, healing and health and reentry for, for women within the context of how we define it today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for, for having me on. And I, I am sorry that I do have to leave a bit early, but I have been um, listening and taking notes because I was, I was gaining a lot of information myself from, from such a knowledgeable um, and meaningful panel and such a meaningful discussion. And so my first takeaway thought is that we need more discussions like this, more forums like this, and more spaces where we're looking at data um, and we're looking at information and we're looking at service uh, from the point of view of serving the most vulnerable, serving those who are sometimes unseen, um, looking at re-entry and saying, hey, this is part of, um, of, of creating a better world, of making, making a more positive world uh, where we're really taking care of, of everyone. And um, yeah, thank you again for having me on. Absolutely, council member. And we certainly look forward to hearing um, more from you and looking at the work you're doing as you remain a staunch advocate for human rights and in the areas of employment, for people who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, housing, and certainly looking at financing um, and supporting reentry services from people coming out. So thank you so much, council member. We'll have you back soon. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll turn now to uh, Reverend Harrigan, right, for some other thoughts, right? I know you wanted to respond to some of the things. I saw you, right? Ears are perking up. You wanted to respond <laughs> to some of the other thoughts from the panelists here. So some of those thoughts, Reverend Harrigan, and also the Beyond Rosie's work, that yeah. you're heading and the importance of that work and what's happening there within the context of this conversation. Absolutely. I just wanted to touch briefly on, on the reentry challenges. And so understanding what does reentry really look like, right? It's not a one size fit all model. Reentry looks different for every individual, whether you're a man or a woman, right? It's it reentry is different. And I'm not, you know, listen, folks. I'm not just the president, I was also a client. I did over 10 years, over a decade in prison, incarcerated. So just understanding that coming out, you know, with women, the, the difference is, is not just, you know, getting re, reunifying with your children, but also understanding that you'll find that most men live with women, whether it's their mother, their sister, their girlfriend, their side, uh, peace, <laughs> their <laughs> wife, their, you know, it, it, you find that they live with women. So as women, as nurturers and, and as caregivers, right, if you are now incarcerated, yeah. who are you coming out to live with, right? you not, because the men you'll find generally don't live on their own, right? right. So now we have a, a greater problem because now you're homeless. Now you have no one to care for you. And so that's, I, I just wanted to really um, um, heighten, heighten that up. It's, and, and then there's the long-termers, 
right? For those of when I came home, most of my mother, my father, my, my daughter moved away, my brother eventually died. People get lost. You lose people. The ones who you who you think, you know, who were there prior to your incarceration that was around that supported you is no longer there. Right. You don't have anything. You don't have anyone. And then the other piece is we cannot just talk about housing. We have to talk about wraparound resources because you could put someone in an apartment with the four walls and they still don't know how to cope. Right. We have to also show and teach coping skills, coping methods and practices, all that, how to heal, because if not, just giving them a key to a door is not going to be as helpful. We have to understand that, you know, people have been traumatized and, and has come through a timeline of hurt, harm, and pain. And so we have to give them these wraparound resources and stop looking at people as people who need, but as people who deserve. And now for our Beyond Rosie's campaign is just that. It, the only female jail on Rikers Island is called the Rose M. Singer Center, dubbed Rosies. And so Beyond Rosies is a campaign that looks beyond the jail, right? One of the, we, we stand on three pillars. One is to close that jail on Rikers Island. The other one is to create, and I need y'all to hear me folks community. We all are abolitionists at heart. But the reality, let's talk reality, not fantasy, what we envision, what we look forward towards a future that we probably won't even see in our lifetime. But we, we do envision abolition, a world without prisons and jails. But the reality is that is just not the case right now, right? So we're looking to secure a place where women can get what they need, what they deserve, the healing, the wellness, say it with me folks, wellness, that's what it's about. Not to treat people who are detained, right? As people who have, you know, done all it. We don't know, right? That's the part of being detained, right? Innocent before, you know, proven guilty, if you can prove it, right? So why are they treated worse than those who have actually either took a plea, been convicted and sent upstate, right? So we're looking at getting a place for women where their children could come, where they can cook, where they can get the resources and the support that is needed to make them not only productive citizens, but to make them yeah. well, right? To have them healed in the communities so that they can then raise their children up so that they too can be protected against the systems that harm us. So Beyond, Beyond Rosies is about that. It's about closing the jail, the only jail on Rikers Island for women, gender non-conforming folks and gender expansive people and creating a trauma responsive place that those who need, I need you to hear me carefully, need a higher level of care until their case can be resolved, right? To get the necessary healing that is needed. And then the other pillar is investing in the community. I don't want to say reinvest because I don't think that's what they did. <laughs> that we just mm -hmm. don't see that, right? Mm -hmm. In our we see gentrification that has nothing to do with us. But we want the money that is saved, right? From these jails, right? To be put into the community so that there are 
services, there are resources that people can utilize. It's about decarceration, folks. People who are inside those jails right now could be utilized. They can utilize alternatives that exist. And that's what we need to talk about, scaling up these alternatives so people can get what they need, whether it's mental wellness, whether it's physical wellness, it's just a holistic wellness. That's what we need to start looking at, not just these punitive, harsh, you know, mm -hmm. incarcerations, you know, just arresting people. And I, and I don't want to diminish crime here, folks. I mean, I don't want to diminish harm, right? Mm -hmm. People do get harmed in the community. And we need to start having those hard conversations about that. We need to talk about violence. We need to talk about people who are harmed and why. We, all, we go all the way back to that old cliche, hurt people hurt people, but healed people can heal people. Mm. And if we want people, when we talk about public safety, then we need to talk about reparation. We need to talk about healing. We need to talk about transformation. We need to talk about all of those things, right, that is going to help this population. And I say this population of people, a pool, a group of all different kinds of awesome people who are hurt and harmed, and do not know how to cope with what they're going through. So they in turn harm others, right? We need to start at the core. We have a history of treating the symptoms and not the core reason why this is happening. Yeah. With that, I'm going to say healing, healing, wellness at the table, beyond Rosie's, look it up. We need all of you to be a part of this campaign for the women, gender non-conforming people, gender expansive people, which includes the trans population. We need to start putting them at the forefront and keeping them there. Well, uh, Reverend White, Har Harrigan, that would be the most awesome way to end our yeah. presentation today, but we do wanna get some, uh, some Closing words from from our other panelists. Uh, we don't have uh, Council Member Jordan anymore, but uh, T. S. Candy, do you have anything that you'd like to just sort of finish with, or thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, yes. Um, thank you all so much again for having me. Um, the closing thoughts that, um, or the takeaways that I would like for um, viewers, everyone, to um, to take away is that. Um, trans women, gender not confirming, black, brown, blue, or yellow, because when you cut yourself and I cut myself, our blood is red, that we all are humans. Animals too, you cut them, they're red. Their blood is red. We are all humans. And we just trying to live, a, a, we just trying to live. Yeah. And if you all have any, locate any, you know, TGNC, Black led organizations, please donate, donate to them clothes, shoes, hair, money, anything yeah. um, to help give back to the community and those that are to, to give uh, to give in direct hand of those that are impacted in the community, the things that they are needing. Cause this is this, when we do our surveys, this is things that they need, you know, pampers, everything, you name it. So um, just please um, treat us like humans. That's great. And also just empowering each and every individual to be part of the uh, solution, uh, no matter who you are, you can help. Yeah. Um, uh, Wendy, would you like to give a few closing words? Yeah, I mean, I've just been listening a lot today and, and sort of getting really inspired from the other panelists. And um, I think the things that I'm coming away with um, are 
I mean, for one, it's not lost to me that most of this panel or the entire panel, except for Andre, is women. And I think that um, that it's important that women be leading these conversations and um, that that the solutions be driven by women and by directly impacted women in particular. Um, I think when it comes to that community investment piece that Sharon was just talking about, I think that also needs to be driven by women. I think um, a lot of times investment sort of schemes or reinvestment schemes sort of trickle down through government and they end up going to really well established um, agencies or whatever. And I think that we need to find more creative ways to redirect funds to community-based organizations and service providers and let them um, let them lead. They know what they're doing in their own communities and let them, you know, do, do what they do best um, and just give them those funds that they need. Um, sorry, I'm getting <laughs> on a tangent again. But um, I also, I, I think it's really important to, to think about housing first. I think there's not much that you can do without a safe place to live. Um, so while that's certainly not an, an end in itself, it's not, it's not the whole answer. I think it is a key part of the the formula is, is folks need to have a place, a safe place to be before they can start dealing with all their other issues. Um, so yeah, housing first, women leading, and overall just I think what we're talking about is reducing harm. I think that um, the, the systems that we have in place do cause harm, and I think that um, we need to find new ways to, to reduce the harm of the systems themselves. Um, not, I mean, before we can start building better, you know. Um, but that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, Angela, want to tie this up? Oh, gee. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, it's um, again, it's the same from listening and being inspired and, and um, what comes to mind. And again, I'll, I'll, I can reaffirm many things that everyone else has said, but but kind of being your the researcher, uh, you know, a researcher on the panel, what comes to mind most often is the importance of the need for the hunger for at least collaboration, because collaboration across systems, collaboration with people that bring different kinds of areas of expertise. I'm in the School of Public Health, something called social medical sciences. All of what we do is really about trying to understand the social context of people's lives. And my students come in, they're, they're well-meaning, the, but they haven't had these kinds of experience. So, you know, I do my best and they are interested in. So, you know, um, you, know uh, um, you know, Candy and, and Rhoda Harrigan, you know, send me an email. I'll send you some students who really want uh, unpaid internships. Not that they, they need, don't need money, but they're willing, they're, they're, they, they want experience. They want, they want direct experience. They want to like, if they want to work in this space to kind of help and heal um, as providers, sometimes they're in medical fields, sometimes they're in public health, sometimes they're interested in both, um, or, or they're interested in doing research that's going to contribute to those kinds of really positive changes, you know, they need some kind of experience. And so again, I think that there are, are um, you know, probably less, and we're not the main people in the research world, but nonetheless, there are, there are those of us who are committed to this kind of work, this kind of action work, action work that makes some difference. And kind of, again, I'm a facilitator to kind of help, you know what the questions are, you know what the issues are, I can help you figure out how to kind of really document that in such a way. It's, it's I also, you know, it is, it is so offensive in many ways that you have to say it's cost effective for people not to be hungry, not to be homeless, not to be, not to be hurt, but, but, in some instances, that's that's the that's what we have to do to do that kind of work to get politicians to give us the funding that we need to do this work. And and so, um, you know, again, just kind of figuring out how to do that that we collect the information that somebody then can take and do the cost effectiveness stuff with it. It's not my area, but but you know, in a way that can help then. Um, kind of be its own weapon in this argument for what kind of resources should be made available for what purposes um, and, you know, and kind of open a window to kind of do the kinds of things, the development, the healing that we need. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, panelists. We really appreciate that. And I just want to say how much it has been a privilege for me as someone who identifies as, as a cis man to be able to be a part of this discussion and just to hear um, how incredibly important 
these issues are for our women within the context of how it's been defined today. And on behalf of the Fortress Society, you've joined today this webinar on reentry for women, trans women, and the LGBTQI plus community in terms of housing, health, and healing. I just want to thank each of you as panelists for joining us. We'll certainly have you back as this is like the first installment in a series of webinars that we'll be hosting at the Fortune Society. Um, T.S. Candy, just really powerful as a leader. Thank you for all of your leadership and work um, with our trans community. Um, yeah. You and your leadership is sorely needed Great. and we will continue to amplify your work um, because it's so critically important. Wendy, as a researcher, um, as someone who consistently elevates the needs of women vis-a-vis -vis reentry and how important that is. We appreciate all of the work that you do um, with okay. others. And we certainly look forward to publications and research that you'll be putting out and we'll be able to share that out with, with our communities. And certainly uh, Reverend Sharon White Harrigan, as someone who I've known for many, many years as my sister and leader and friend um, is someone who I respect. Thank you for just amplifying the needs of women as it's critically important. Yes. Um, and we look forward to the continued work you'll do with WCJA and um, the Beyond Rosies and other work that you do, because yeah. you're not just solely focused on women, although that's a, that centers yeah. your work. You're also a part yeah. of a larger advocacy movement to end mass incarceration, to yeah. make sure conditions of confinement are addressed and that reentry is offered in a way that's holistic. So we thank you, Reverend Sharon Harrigan White, and certainly, uh, Professor Dahlia, thank you for your many, many years of, of dedication to teaching and researching and just being this partner with Fortune in the way that you do your work and just amplifying the needs um, of people who've been impacted by the criminal legal system um, in academia. That's okay. critically needed as many of us have been in academia, have taught, et cetera. We know how important that is and we thank you for that. And to thank my you. dear colleague, Karen and, and co-host, and the host for this show, thank you, Karen, for your leadership as well in all of this. And were it not for you, we would not have this webinar. So again, I'm deeply privileged to follow your leadership, Karen, in producing this webinar. And we will certainly be back again with a series of other webinars. And the other thing that could not happen is this entire webinar, its organization, its logistical setup and technical aspects. So I certainly want to acknowledge uh, Sarah, um, and obviously, um, Kendall, Kendall uh, our, dear leader, <laughs> our dear leaders at Fortune's communications division. And yeah, without their you. leadership, we would not have this run as smoothly as it did from the showing of the um, slides, just to the sheer coordination of all of this, because a lot yeah. goes into coordinating this. So we want to thank all of the participants who've joined us, and we will be sharing this out with their broader community in the future. So thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. And we will talk. Thank you. Soon. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody be well. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> T.S. Candy, I'm coming looking for you. <laughs> thank you, Karen. <laughs>